Thank you, President Ballard. As you said, I'm Shannon Fragos now. I'm a professor of theology here. It is my true delight to get to introduce Dr. Jennifer Besky, our speaker for today. Um, I want to take a point of privilege just to say a little bit about her because I'm so excited. Um, Dr. Besky began her academic career as a Romer scholar. Many of you know that I... <laughs> whose work I teach and say, you have to take this criticism seriously. Wow. Wow. Uh, her, Jennifer's first book um, was called God and the Victim, Traumatic Intrusions on Grace and Freedom, and was a serious wrestling with how our theology holds up in cases of abuse, neglect, and trauma. Her second book, and she started teaching, and like one of her mentors, uh, Sister Margaret Farley, did not stay in the space of her intellectual passions and interests alone, but allowed her work to be shaped by the difficulties that she saw her own students facing. And so she turned her attention to the very tricky topic of sexual ethics. And so her second book that we are here today to talk about is called Hookup Culture and Christian Ethics, The Lives and Longings of Emerging Adults. What I find most stunning about this work is that uh, the methodology that Dr. Bestie puts together, that she does not walk in as a academic and tell a group of students this is what sex should look like, mm. but rather listens with such attention and draws out um, and challenges in a dialogue with her students in a remarkable way. Jennifer's current position has been for some time. She is professor of theology and co-chair for Catholic thought and culture at St. John's University and the College of St. Benedict. Um, it is a hard thing to talk about sexuality and to talk about sexual violence of any kind. It is difficult. I am grateful that we all are here to do that. There is no one in whose hands I would feel so safe as Jennifer's, or Dr. Essie's. Um, but we do recognize that this is hard, and we're going to talk about things, and if at any point um, you need to stand up and give yourself some space, that's really fine. There are a number of quiet spaces on campus that are mentioned in the program and you can direct, will be directed to. Louisville Seminary is also uh, blessed to have a counseling center in the basement of Nelson Hall which will be opened and staffed today from 10, uh, 11 to 5. Um, I could not be more delighted to have a scholar I respect so enormously be here with us today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. James Rebecca. Toxic 
toxic cultural trends that fuel unhealthy and unjust sexual relationships? How can we create sexually just Christian communities? It's going to take a lot of courage. So what I would like to do, if we really want to understand toxic sexual norms in our culture, one of our most accurate sources of knowledge, I believe, comes from young adults. They are the ones who have most recently undergone sexual socialization in our culture, and they have the maturity to really reflect upon it, and in my experiences, I've been amazed at how honest and insightful they are. They also are the most savvy in terms of understanding pop culture, the latest trends, and social media. So I'm going to be drawing today on my research on college party and hookup culture. And I never imagined I'd, I'd do this as research. I was just teaching Christian sexual ethics. Uh, and if there was such a high demand among young people, I often taught eight sessions a year. And uh, so my students were kind of reacting skeptically around 2007 when I assigned adult researchers uh, analyses of hookup culture. And my students said, yeah, I mean, some of this resonates, but adults can't really understand our culture. They haven't been socialized the way we have been, and they don't live our reality day in and day out. And I thought, that's a good point. Um, so I said, why don't you all go out and be researchers and observe and analyze college parties? And so I'm going to share with you what they have to say. And then I'm also going to draw at a different university on 150 students' theological and ethical reflections that come from many assignments. All right, so I'd like to just mention briefly what happens at college parties today. My students went to seven <laughs> different states and observed and analyzed parties at public and private universities. And so the major themes, as I read these, I mean, I read these for years before I had the idea of collecting them. First, they start with pre-gaming. And the emphasis is on excessive alcohol consumption. So men will hang out for two hours and pre-game and maybe drink seven to 10 shots. And I, I was skeptical at the first. Mm. But I mean, this is just typical. Women will spend two to three hours getting dressed for the parties and drinking shot after shot, while and their, their, their need is to dress as sexy as possible so that they can gain male attention and approval. Um, and then once they get to the parties, they drink more, and so they feel comfortable enough socializing and grinding, which is their contemporary form of dancing. Even though I never asked a single question about sex when I asked them to go out and observe parties, all 126 students observed peers hooking up at parties. And if you're blissfully unaware of what a hookup is today, it is uh, casual sexual activity, which is usually fueled by a lot of alcohol, and it occurs between basically strangers or acquaintances. Now, this is not a culture where it's just, oh, do what you like and we'll respect you. It's a culture where there's actual rules. And the rules are you're supposed to separate your physical self from your emotional and your relational self. So the rules are do not develop any feeling of attachment, emotions, and don't desire any kind of relationship. And if you do, you are viewed as, as you'll see, clingy and pathetic. All right, so there were many troubling dynamics, and if you want to, you can read about it in my book, uh, of what they observed, but I want to focus on a question I just put in my assignment at the last minute. Do you think your peers are happy and fulfilled at parties? Interestingly, I only 10% gave me an uncomplicated answer of yes, yeah, and their reasons were they look happy, you know, they're laughing. 90% had a more complicated answer, and they described some, most, or all of their peers, they thought, were dissatisfied and unhappy with this culture. Well, why? Their reasons, as I coded their responses, they were very critical, privately, of how they, they were under pressure to drink excessively. That is the norm, that's what you do, that's what is fun, and many were unhappy with that. They were also really dissatisfied with this hookup norm, this expectation. And both men and women described a sense of emptiness, 
loneliness after hookups. Uh, and I, I found this really interesting, both genders. They also expressed a disillusionment with the culture. Uh, and many expressed hurt because this ideal of an unattached, emotionless hookup rarely translates into reality. Usually one partner, and it's usually women, develop feelings and desire more. Women also overwhelmingly expressed uh, loss of self-esteem, anxiety, and depression uh, as a result of how they're treated in this culture. And women overwhelmingly uh, really wrote about negative sexual experiences, which could range from the typical hookup, which is focused on solely the man's sexual pleasure, or you know, ranging all the way to sexual assault. And as we know from the Me Too movement and all research, there is an epidemic of sexual assault on college campuses and in our culture. Um, and so, you know, it, it's so difficult. In my book, I, I can't even capture the suffering that students are experiencing. Um, I mean, when I said, I really want to learn about this culture from you, I, I get it. I don't, I don't understand. Please tell me. I was shocked by how many students would seek me out and say, if you really want to know about it, here are my experiences. And I even spent three years interviewing students, and they had the option of, of having their face shown, or having it blurred, or having their voice blurred. And I said, I just want to know the truth. What are your honest experiences? And so I created a DVD, which um, I can give you access to if you want to use it. But anyways, the amount of suffering it, it, it's alarming. Um, so even if we could magically end sexual assault that's endemic to this culture, I, I know from my research that young adults would still, especially women, would still be experiencing post-traumatic stress symptoms, I have research on it, uh, depression and loss of self-esteem as a result of how they're treated in this culture. So we have to come to grips with the reality is that young adolescents and adults are being socialized to believe that sex ought to be completely casual and fun and recreational, and it should not involve attachment or desire for relationship. My students have also taught me that sex is increasingly being viewed in our culture as something that you constantly have to work at. And it'll come to no surprise that working at sex in our capitalist culture requires much money and consumption. You need to buy porn, the latest sex toys. You need to sign up for pole dancing classes. I'll never forget seeing this poster at Xavier University, this Catholic university, encouraging students to sign up for pole dancing. You know, and I raised questions about it, and it was staunchly defended. <laughs> so the underlying fear driving our consumptive practices is that if we do not keep things new and exciting and spiced up, our partner will get bored, tire of us, and leave us. You know, one morning, uh, it was sunny and warm in Minnesota, so I took my students outside, and I was listening to one of my small groups talking about their culture, and a young woman said, she just spoke about how there's such focus and pressure on sexual experimentation and being open-minded about the latest new things. And you know, she said, it gets to be exhausting. And I was just struck by the weariness in her tone. And I, I, I just felt incredible anger, you know? This is, there's something seriously wrong in our culture when 20-year-olds are weary about sex. I mean, this is clearly not what God intends for us. Uh, I know I'm stating the obvious when I say that the toxic sexual norms in our culture insidiously are undermining God's very purpose in creating us as sexual beings. You know, to experience that joy and, and pleasure and intimacy um, and that sense of communion with another person who commits to love us, care for us. Um, so, what are we to do as Christian communities, as religious communities? I am going to offer you three suggestions. First, we need to situate discussions of sexuality in our communities within a broader framework of what it means to become fully human like Jesus. 
Second, we need to abandon a judgmental and taboo approach to sex in favor of a sexual justice approach. And I'm sure most of you are thinking, oh, my church doesn't have any taboo or judgment about sex. <laughs> <laughs> a very courageous countercultural narrative reclaiming just sex and just love as what is truly erotic. Okay, so why? Why turn to Jesus? About eight years ago, you know, if I've learned anything from teaching sexual ethics to young adults, it is that it is absolutely insufficient for churches to begin talking about sex by sharing church teachings about sex. Um, even when I gave the greatest theological text on sex, I was so excited. They're insufficient if our goal is to inspire young people to follow Christ and to really make decisions that are healthy and just for themselves and others. So it, I'm not saying it's, not, it's important, but I think it's not the first step. So what I decided to experiment with was once my students, you know, studied gender norms and sexual norms and really studied hookup culture, I said, okay, now you're going to read Poverty of Spirit. And I didn't say much. I just said, this is a book about Johann Metz is exploring how Jesus' choice to embrace his human condition saves humanity. So Metz isn't arguing his divinity doesn't save us. But he's saying, let's pay attention to the way this humanity saves us. And I say, okay, we're doing this because students, you know, Christians believe that Jesus is embodying what it means to be fully human and to realize our fullest potential. And Christians believe that Christ's path is the genuine way to experience joy and fulfillment. So let's just, let's just explore. Okay, and in this text, Metz is arguing that becoming fully human means embracing poverty of spirit. That's what Jesus did. And so I had no idea how this would go, but I thought I'd try it out. And it turns out that this text, I just had them read it, and I said, well, write about what you find life is, what resonates with you. And I was struck by how much they grabbed onto Jesus' temptations in the desert about how you know, they could really identify with this temptation to flee your humanity and cling to your strength. Uh, and so in terms of the first temptation, command these stones to become loaves of bread. My students you know, wrote about how you know, Jesus is being tempted to seize his divinity and gratify his needs instantly, rather than accepting that being human means that we often feel desires and longings that remain unfulfilled. We are uncomfortable. Uh, and they say, you know, this is right on with our culture. Hookup culture tempts us to gratify our sexual and relational desires instantly, even though it's only a temporary fix, and it might, you know, create negative consequences. The, the second one, the second temptation, Metz depicts Jesus trembling, you know, on this pinnacle of the temple. And he's trembling, overlooking an abyss. And he's scared to death. And Satan just says, throw yourself down, escape this miserable plight, and the angels will save you. And students, you know, they, they interpreted this abyss to be fear, harm, pain, suffering, despair. And they said, yeah, you know, our culture offers us a temporary escape from all of our stress and our fear, you know, the deep things that we don't talk about by excessively drinking and casual sex. Third, the temptation is to fall down and worship me and all the kingdoms of the world shall be yours. You know, I ask my students, well, what's really at stake in this temptation to have power over all others? And students, you know, really say, that way you can't be touched, you can't be hurt. <coughs> and so, you know, they very much see this as, you know, they very much identify with this temptation to seize power over another because they're so scared the other one. If they don't do it, the other one will have power over them. They're, they're so scared of that power over. So after they read the text and they have a chance to talk to each other about what they found life-giving, I stop their discussion. 
I didn't want to tell them what I thought how to be clear it was. I didn't want to tell them anything that I thought. I wanted to know, you know, what they really thought. So I said, here's an assignment. So they had to imagine that the second coming occurs. And Jesus returns as a sophomore transfer student. <laughs> 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 Towards yourself 
and having the courage to live out your unique calling. And both of these students wrote about how much they struggle with both of these aspects in their lives. And so, you know, I, I can't say enough about how much they struggle with that. And, it, and they just, I mean, to be unique, to stand out, to go after what they really desire. Um, you know, most cannot do this because they long so much for, you know, social acceptance. That's what they're basing their self-worth on. So we need to be able to, you know, really go deep when we're talking about this, to give them the strength to stand up and be who God created them to be. Third, they interpreted Jesus rightly as loving neighbor as himself, and they were really drawn to nets, uh, his depiction of what this means. It requires a willingness to become vulnerable, to be affected and transformed by our encounter with others. And I'll just quote Metz quickly. We must be able to open up to the other person, to let that person's distinctive personality unfold, even though it often frightens us. We often keep the other person down and only see what we want to see. Thus, we never really encounter the mysterious secret of their being, only ourselves. And students really, really resonate with us. So what are their main challenges? The first one will come as no surprise to you, egoism. And so obviously Christians have been struggling with egoism since the beginning. But what really kind of shocked me was how much this is encouraged and promoted by parents as well as pop culture. So here's just one representative quote. College years are often looked at a time to be wild and self-indulgent. Society often encourages students to experiment and do what makes them happy, which makes us selfish. It gives us a sense of control that makes it difficult to become fully human. You know, I, I just, I can't say enough how insightful uh, students were. Second, students also have a hard time loving their neighbors themselves because they are so deeply fearful of being vulnerable. When I read their reflections about vulnerability, what vulnerability means to young adults is sharing your authentic self and expressing a full range of emotions. And what I didn't fully get until I read what they had to say is how much this is associated with weakness. And so here's you know, one, one young man. When surrounded by a status-minded social environment where weakness is discouraged, it's extremely hard to accept it's okay to be vulnerable with others when it comes to feelings and relationships. Revealing these things will negatively impact our social standing. You know, another theme is that this is so deeply risky because we're going, we, we might get rejected, you know, our real selves, and be really hurt. Quote, falling in true love is exciting and something college kids want to do but are afraid of. Overcoming the obstacle of completely taking down your brick wall, piece by piece, and letting another being in is one of the greatest feats. And I share this with you because when I read this, I thought, Whoa, this, this encompasses what so many of these students are writing about. The brick wall that they need to have, the armor they need to keep themselves safe. You know, I, I just, one of my advisors said, society is a harsh place to live. You know, I don't think I would have described society that way as an 18 year old, you know, when I was in college. So, I mean, this is, you know, and, and all of you, I know you're thinking, well, all of us struggle with vulnerability. But if you could read their reflections, I, I feel like their fear is amped up, you know, a thousand percent from what I experienced. And I think it's partially because of social media. It's partially because of this clear winners versus losers that is in our culture. Um, and so it, it's just very deep. Okay, so as I was, you know, reading the first 75 papers, which, you know, I, I didn't plan on collecting. <coughs> Um, you know, but I, I read them, and you know, I thought, whoa, what these students are describing them when they imagine Jesus at these parties. Jesus was—he was a misfit, like he was really unique. So you know, they imagine him, you know, like 
attending to like the most marginalized yeah. at the party, the ones who are feeling left out. He's so kind and empathetic. So these are how he is described, and the college partier is described in, in an absolutely opposing way. And so I said, you know, this is what I got from your papers. Am I am I being accurate? Like, is it really this opposed? And my, you know, my first class said, oh, get rid of college partier and just put college students. <laughs> this is what we need to be in order to be academically successful and be able to get a job and be, you know, have our careers. And I thought, oh my, you know, because what this really reveals is that their parents, their professors, you know, this is what they write about. And, you know, their culture is encouraging them to embrace these things when it comes to their professional lives. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. So how do we expect them to be following Christ mm -hmm. in the other aspects of their lives? Right. Mm -hmm. And so this is, I mean, this just shows how deep, you know, there's, this isn't just about sex, it's not about just trends. This is deeply rooted in our neoliberal capitalist culture. This is what you need to be successful. My students are telling me. Okay, so this is what, where things I think can get exciting. You know, if you're if you're in dialogue with adolescents and young adults, you know, this is where you can really invite <coughs> reflection. You know, in what ways in your life are you espousing these values? You know, what's underneath that? <coughs> and how are you embodying Jesus' values in your life? And I think it's important to pay attention to the positive ways that they do see themselves in this light. Uh, and then, you know, if you're talking to Christians, how can you more deeply embody these values, follow Jesus' way of being in the world, uh, and still, you know, be academically successful in a career? You know, how can you negotiate? How can you become wise? You know, how can you play the game without giving your soul? Um, as a teacher, of course, I'm really curious about whether this approach to full humanity is working. And so I've collected anonymous evaluations for the past eight years. And I've been really excited by, you know, these are anonymous. And it really does seem to foster personal discernment growth. And, you know, students say, this, this made a difference in my life. Um, so I had students who actually came up to me and whispered after class, I asked someone out on a date. We <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is absolutely really abnormal. You know, and it was so many days. Maybe dinner for someone. Like I had, I had one student who has, you know, been together with this boy. She asked her on a date after she read Mets. You know, she <laughs> students 
have responded to Farley's account of sexual justice. So I briefly want to talk about it. For Farley, justice requires that we affirm one another according to our concrete reality. I mean, I think this is brilliant for every every relationship we have with our children, you know, with everyone, our students. Okay, so what Farley is arguing is that what is our concrete reality? She says there's three characteristics we have to take into account. First, we have the freedom to make autonomous choices and determine for ourselves our ends and our loves. Second, we're deeply relational creatures. We have to affirm this. We need others in order to realize our potential, to grow in our capacity to love and know God, ourselves, and others. And third, we're all unique. So Farley states, affirming another person also involves knowing the person well enough to judge whether our interactions are positively contributing to or diminishing his or her prospects for growth and flourishing now and in the future. You know, what if we all, you know, could always keep this into account? All right, so from these three characteristics, Farley says justice entails treating others as an end, not solely as a means to our agenda. And she arrives at seven norms that she, say are, that she says are necessary for just sex. So first, one must do no unjust harm. Second, free consent is essential. Third, mutuality. Fourth, equality of power. This is essential to avoid harm and make possible free consent and mutuality. And fifth, commitment. And she says, at the very least, a commitment to do no unjust harm to the person. She has two other norms, but these five are what I want you to focus on. Because for the past eight years, I have my students individually write and get into small groups, and I say, which ones of these are really needed for just sex? What could you take out and still have just sex? 